Hello Set Apart Saints, this is David. In this video, I'm going to share the testimony of the saint who witnessed against the Antichrist Beast Popes. I've listed the most significant quotes to reinforce that proclaiming that the office of the papacy, the Popes of Rome, fulfill Bible prophecy is the little horn of Daniel 7, the son of perdition of 2 Thessalonians 2, and the Antichrist Beast of Revelation, so that you can see that it's not just my interpretation, but the belief of the saints for over a thousand years many of whom paid for their testimony, their witness, with their blood. So here are some declarations from whole church bodies as the Protestant reformers took back control of the nations where the Pope's false gospel had misled people. The Church of England Book of Homilies in the 16th century says, The Bishop of Rome teaches that they that are under him are free from all burdens and charges of the commonwealth, and obedience towards their prince, most clearly against Christ's doctrine and St. Peter's. He ought, therefore, rather to be called Antichrist and the successor of the scribes and Pharisees than Christ's vicar, or St. Peter's successor. Seeing that, not only on this point, but also in other weighty matters of Christian religion, in matters of remission and forgiveness of sins and of salvation, he teaches so directly against St. Peter and against our Savior Christ. After this ambition to be head of all the church and lord of all kingdoms, the bishop of Rome became at once the spoiler and destroyer both of the church, which is the kingdom of our Savior Christ, and of the Christian empire, and all Christian kingdoms, as a universal tyrant over all. The Church of Scotland Confession of Faith in 1516 says, There is no other head of the church than the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome be in any sense the head thereof, but is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition, that exalteth himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God. While I list these confessions of faith, what I want you to keep in mind is, are the Protestants proclaiming these things these days? Are the Lutherans proclaiming these things? Is your Protestant pastor teaching these things? No. They've all been put away. The enemy has been very successful in putting all the witness of the saints away so that you're not hearing it. But they've proclaimed it boldly to defy the Antichrist beast Pope of Rome. So the Lutheran Confession of Faith in 1613 says, The Pope is the very Antichrist who exalted himself above and opposes himself against Christ, because he will not permit Christians to be saved without his power, which nevertheless is nothing, and is neither ordained nor commanded by God. Since the Bishop of Rome has erected a monarchy in Christendom, claiming for himself dominion over all churches and pastors, exalting himself to be called God, wishing to be adored, boasting to have all power in heaven and upon earth, to dispose of all ecclesiastic matters, to decide upon articles of faith, to authorize and interpret at his pleasure the scriptures, to make a traffic of souls, to disregard vows and oaths, to appoint new divine services, and in respect to the civil government, to trample underfoot the lawful authority of magistrates by taking away, giving, and exchanging kingdoms, we believe and maintain that it is the very Antichrist and the son of perdition, predicted in the word of God under the emblem of a harlot clothed in scarlet, seated upon the seven hills of the great city, which has dominion over the kings of the earth. And we expect that the Lord will consume it with the spirit of his mouth, and finally destroy it with the brightness of his coming, as he promised. The Irish Articles of Religion of 1615. The Bishop of Rome is so far from being the supreme head of the Universal Church of Christ, that his works and doctrines do plainly discover him to be that man of sin foretold in the Holy Scriptures, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and abolish with the brightness of his coming. The Westminster Confession of Faith of 1644. There is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition, that exalteth himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God. So you see a recurring theme among all these believers. An act of Parliament ratified the statement in 1649. The London Baptist Confession of 1689 says, The Lord Jesus is the head of the church by the appointment of the Father. All power for the calling, institution, order, or government of the church is invested in a supreme and sovereign manner. Neither can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition, that exalteth himself in the church against Christ, and all that is called God, whom the Lord shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So you see this same theme, and they're all proclaiming it as church bodies, and this has been lost in these end times. People are debating on Facebook and YouTube, who is the Antichrist? Who is the Antichrist? And these people have already told you who the Antichrist is. So keep the following testimonies in mind when persecution strikes. For we have a great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us, who have run the race, who stayed true to Messiah and exposed the enemy. 
Arnulf was the Bishop of Orleans in the 10th century. Arnulf disagreed with the policies and morals of Pope John the 15th. At the Council of Reims, which was called by the King of France in 991, Arnulf declared that the pontiff, clad in purple and gold, was Antichrist, sitting in the temple of God and showing himself as God. Beringer of Tours in 1088 was a gifted teacher and brilliant theologian, for he called Pope Leo IX not pontifex, but pontifex and pultifex, the Roman Church, a council of vanity, the church of the malignant, and the apostolic see, the seat of Satan. Erhard II, in 1240, was the Archbishop of Salzburg. He denounced Pope Gregory IX at the Council of Regensburg, stated at a synod of bishops held at Regensburg in 1240 that the people of his day were accustomed to calling the Pope Antichrist. John Wycliffe, who translated the Latin Vulgate Bible into English and placed it in the hands of the people, said, We suppose that Antichrist, the head of all these evil men, is the Pope of Rome. Matthias of Jano was a 14th century Bohemian ecclesiastical writer. His writings paved the way for the Hussite movement. He said, The Antichrist has already come. He is neither Jew, pagan Saracen, nor worldly tyrant, but the man who opposes Christian truth and the Christian life by way of deception. He is and will be the most wicked Christian, the Pope, falsely styling himself by that name, assuming the highest station in the church and possessing the highest consideration, arrogating dominion over all ecclesiastics and laymen, one who, by the workings of Satan, assumes to himself power and wealth and honor, and makes the church, with its goods and sacraments, subservient to his own carnal ends. Sir John Oldcastle was an English Lollard leader. He said, But as touching the Pope and his spirituality, I owe them neither suit nor service. For so much as I know him by the Scriptures to be the great Antichrist, the son of perdition, the open adversary of God, and the abomination standing in the holy place. I know him, the Pope, by the Scriptures, to be the great Antichrist, the son of perdition. Rome is the very nest of Antichrist, and out of that nest come all the disciples of him. William White, a well-spoken priest and follower of John Wycliffe, said, That the wicked living of the Pope and his holiness is nothing else but the devilish estate and heavy yoke of Antichrist, and therefore he is an enemy unto Christ's truth. William Tyndale translated the Scriptures into English. He said, The preaching of God's word is hateful and contrary to them. Why? For it is impossible to preach Christ, except thou preach against Antichrist, the Pope. That is to say, them which with their false doctrine and violence of sword, enforce to quench the true doctrine of Christ. Tindo was arrested, tried, and sentenced to death by the Antichrist beast popes of Rome. Holtrick Zwingli was a great Swiss reformer. He said, I know that in it works the might and power of the devil, that is, of the Antichrist. The papacy has to be abolished. By no other means can it be more thoroughly routed than by the word of God, because as soon as the world receives this in the right way, it will turn away from the Pope without compulsion. Love that quote, and I'm trying to bring that to fulfillment by exposing the deceptions of the Pope to render him powerless. John Calvin in the 16th century was an influential French theologian. He said, I deny him to be the vicar of Christ, who, in furiously persecuting the gospel, demonstrates by his conduct that he is the Antichrist. I deny him to be the successor of Peter. I deny him to be the head of the church. Some persons think us too severe and censorious when we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist. Daniel and Paul had predicted that Antichrist would sit in the temple of God. We affirm him to be the Pope. But those who are of this opinion do not consider that they bring the same charge of presumption against Paul himself, after whom we speak. Martin Luther sparked the Protestant Reformation. He said, Nothing else in the kingdom of Babylon and of the very Antichrist. For who is the man of sin and the son of perdition? But he who by his teaching and his ordinances increases the sin and perdition of souls in the church, while he, the Pope, yet sits in the church as if he were God. All these conditions have now, for many ages, been fulfilled by the papal tyranny. I know that the Pope is the Antichrist and that his throne is that of Satan himself. Nicholas von Amsdorf was the colleague of Luther. He said, He will be revealed and come to naught before the last day, so that every man shall comprehend and recognize that the Pope is the real, true Antichrist and not the Vicar of Christ. Therefore, those who consider the Pope and his bishops as Christian shepherds and bishops are deeply in error. But even more are those who believe the Turk is the Antichrist. Because the Turk rules outside the church and does not sit in the holy place, nor does he seek to bear the name of Christ, but is an open antagonist of Christ and his church. This does not need to be revealed, but it is clear and evident, because he persecutes Christians openly, and not as the Pope does, secretly under the form of godliness. 
Philip Melanchthon was a German reformer in the 16th century. He said, Since it is certain that the pontiffs and the monks have forbidden marriage, it is most manifest and true without any doubt that the Roman pontiff, with his whole order and kingdom, is very Antichrist. Likewise, in Second Thessalonians 2, Paul clearly says that the man of sin will rule in the church, exalting himself above the worship of God. But it is certain that the popes do rule in the church, and under the title of the church, in defending idols. Wherefore I affirm that no heresy hath risen, nor indeed shall be, with which these descriptions of Paul can more truly and certainly accord and agree than with this pontifical kingdom. John Hooper was the bishop of Gloucester from 1551 to 1554, an English reformer who was martyred during the Queen Mary persecutions. He said, Because God hath given this light unto my countrymen, which be all persuaded that the bishop of Rome, nor none other, is Christ's vicar upon the earth. It is no need to use any long or copious oration. It is so plain that it needeth no probation. The very properties of Antichrist, I mean of Christ's great and principal enemy, are so openly known to all men that are not blinded with the smoke of Rome, that they know him to be the beast that John described in the Apocalypse. In 1555, Master John Bradford, a faithful minister, valiantly and cheerfully gave his blood testifying against the Antichrist beast Pope. He said, The usurped authority of the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome is undoubtedly that great Antichrist, of whom the apostles do so much admonish us. Wherefore I am now condemned, and shall be burned as a heretic. For because I will not grant the Antichrist of Rome to be Christ's vicar general and supreme head of the church, here and everywhere upon the earth, by God's ordinance. Hugh Latimer, the Bishop of Worcester, was burned to death for his witness against the Pope next to John Bradley and Nicholas Ridley. He said, What fellowship hath Christ with Antichrist? Therefore it is not lawful to bear the yoke of the Papist. Come forth from among them, and separate yourselves from them, saith the Lord. Nicholas Ridley was the English Bishop of London. He said, The see of Rome is the seat of Satan, and the bishop of the same, that maintaineth the abominations thereof, is Antichrist himself indeed. And for the same causes, the see at this day is the same which St. John calls in his revelation Babylon, or the whore of Babylon and spiritually Sodom and Egypt, the mother of fornications and abominations upon the earth. Thomas Cradner was the Archbishop of Canterbury. He was responsible for establishing the first doctrinal and liturgical structures of the Reformed Church of England. He was tried for treason and heresy, imprisoned for two years. He was set in a tower and forced to watch the execution of Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley. He fainted at the sight of the burnings, and under pressure, he renounced his faith. On March 21, 1556, he withdrew his forced confession, proclaimed the truth about the true faith, and testified against the Pope. He proclaimed, Christ biddeth us to obey the king. The bishop of Rome biddeth us to obey himself. Therefore, unless he be Antichrist, I cannot tell what to make of him. Wherefore, if I should obey him, I cannot obey Christ. Whereof it followeth Rome to be the seed of Antichrist, and the Pope to be the very Antichrist himself. I could prove the same by many other scriptures, old writers, and strong reasons. As for the Pope, I refuse him as Christ's enemy and the Antichrist, with all his false doctrine. Thomas Cranmer was taken to where Latimer and Ridley had been burnt six months before and set on fire. He placed his hand in the fire, the one with which he had falsely signed the renouncement of his beliefs, and said, This hath offended. He held his hand in the fire, never pulling it out until the fire took all of him. That's a hero of the faith. John Holy, in the 16th century, was a Cambridge King's College minister. He said, Mark well here, good Christians, who is this beast, and worshippers that shall be partakers of that unspeakable torment. The beast is none other than the carnal and fleshly kingdom of Antichrist, the Pope with his rabble of false prophets and ministers, as it is most manifest, which to maintain their high titles, worldly promotions, and dignities, do much cruelty, daily more and more set forth and establish their own traditions, decrees, decretals, contrary to God's holy ordinances, statutes, laws, and commands, and wholly repugnant to his sincere and pure religion and true worshiping. John Knox, a great leader of the Reformation in Scotland, said, First, then, not only are all the impious traditions and ceremonies of the Papists taken away, but also that tyranny, which the Pope himself has for many ages exercised over the Church, is altogether abolished, and it is provided that all persons shall in the future acknowledge him to be the very Antichrist and son of perdition who Paul speaks of. The Mass is abolished as being an accursed abomination and a diabolical profanation of the Lord's Supper, and it is forbidden to all persons in the whole kingdom of Scotland either to celebrate or hear it. 
as for your romish church it is now corrupted i no more doubt that it is the synagogue of satan and the head thereof called the pope to be the man of sin of whom the apostle speaketh william folk was an english puritan in the sixteenth century who disputed with society of jesus priests about their false teachings he said the sea being found it is easy to find the person of st paul's description and this note especially that excludeth the heathen tyrants he shall sit in the temple of god which when we see to be fulfilled in the pope although none of the eldest fathers could see it because it was performed after their death we owe nothing doubt to say and affirm still that the pope is the man of sin and the son of perdition the adversary that lifteth up himself above all that is called god roger william in the seventeenth century was the first baptist pastor in america he spoke of the pope as the pretended vicar of christ on earth who sits as god over the temple of god exalting himself not only above all that is called god but over the souls and consciences of all his vassals yea over the spirit of christ over the holy spirit yea and of god himself speaking against the god of heaven thinking to change times and laws but he is the son of perdition in the book fall of babylon cotton mather in the eighteenth century said is the pope of rome to be looked upon as the antichrist whose coming and reigning was foretold in the ancient oracles the oracles of god foretold the rising of an antichrist in the christian church and in the pope of rome all the characteristics of that antichrist are so marvelously answered that if any one who reads the scriptures do not see it there is a marvelous blindness upon them i want you to think about that think about that statement and what's going on right now as you look at comments on facebook and youtube and they're trying to figure out who's the antichrist and look at this clear plain statement in the 18th century he's telling you straight up as he's the pope of rome is the son of perdition he's the antichrist and it's so marvelously fulfilled in them that if you read the scriptures and you don't see it you're marvelously blind and that ties in interestingly with messiah's words to the end times church era of laodicea what did he say he said you think you're rich and have need of nothing but i tell you that you're wretched miserable naked poor and blind and that's exactly how people are today they think they know scriptural truth they think they know how the end times is going to play out and and the futuristic seventh week of daniel and the fulfillment of revelation in the end times and the seven year tribulation period featuring a one man antichrist they think they know the truth but they're blind they've been deceived by the enemy and all these testimonies from these spirit-filled men have been pushed aside by the enemy you don't hear these quotes from your pastor in the book a course on the man of sin samuel cooper in the eighteenth century said if antichrist is not to be found in the chair of saint peter meaning with the pope he is nowhere to be found sir isaac newton was a faithful expositor of prophecy he said but it the little horn was a kingdom of a different kind from the other ten kingdoms by its eyes it was a seer and by its mouth speaking great things and changing times and laws it was a prophet as well as a king and such a seer a prophet and a king is the church of rome with his mouth he gives laws to kings and nations as an oracle and pretends to infallibility and that his dictates are binding to the whole world which is to be a prophet in the highest degree jonathan edwards was an american gospel preacher in the nineteenth century he said so that antichrist has proved the greatest and the most cruel enemy the church of christ ever had agreeable to the description given of the church of rome and i saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of jesus thus did the devil and his great minister antichrist rage with violence and cruelty against the church of christ and thus did the whore of babylon make herself drunk with the blood of the saints and martyrs of jesus john wesley was an anglican cleric and theologian he the pope is in an emphatical sense the man of sin as he increases all manner of sin above measure and he is too properly styled the son of perdition as he has caused the death of numberless multitudes both of his opposers and followers he is i that exalteth himself above all that is called god or that is worshipped claiming the highest power and highest honor claiming the prerogatives which belong to god alone the whole succession of popes from gregory the seventh are undoubtedly antichrists yet this hinders not but that the last pope in the succession will be more eminently the antichrist the man of sin adding to that of his predecessors a peculiar degree of wickedness from the bottomless pit rev j a wiley a scottish historian of religion and minister said the same line of proof which establishes that christ is the promised messiah conversely applied establishes that the roman system is the predicted apostasy in the life of christ we behold the converse of what the antichrist must be and in the prophecy of the antichrist we are shown the converse of what christ must be and was and when we place the papacy between the two and compare it with each we find on the one hand that it is the perfect converse of christ as seen in his life 
and on the other that it is the perfect image of antichrist as shown in the prophecy of him we conclude therefore that if jesus of nazareth be the christ the roman papacy is the antichrist charles haddon spurgeon in the nineteenth century a reformed baptist preacher said her idolatries are the scorn of reason and the aberrance of faith the iniquities of her practice and the enormities of her doctrine almost surpass belief popery is as much the masterpiece of satan as the gospel is the masterpiece of god there can scarcely be imagined anything of devilish craftiness or satanic wickedness which could be compared with her she is unparalleled as the queen of iniquity behold upon her forehead the name mystery babylon the great the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth the church of rome and her teachings are a vast mountain of rubbish covering the truth of god for weary years good men could not get at the foundation because of this very much rubbish it is the bounden duty of every christian to pray against antichrist and as to what antichrist is no sane man ought to question if it not be the popery in the church of rome there is nothing in the world that can be called by that name if there were to be issued a hue and cry for antichrist we should certainly take up this church on suspicion and it would certainly not be let loose again for it so exactly answers the description popery is contrary to christ's gospel and it is the antichrist and we ought to pray against it it should be the daily prayer of every believer that antichrist might be hurled like a millstone into the flood and for christ because it wounds christ because it robs christ of his glory because it puts sacramental efficacy in the place of his atonement and lifts a piece of bread into the place of the savior and a few drops of water into the place of the holy ghost and puts mere fallible men like ourselves up as the vicar of christ on earth if we pray against it because it is against him we shall love the persons though we hate their errors we shall love their souls though we loathe and detest their dogmas and so the breath of our prayers will be sweetened because we turn our faces towards christ when we pray i am ashamed that sons of the reformers should bow themselves before the beast and give so much as a single farthing to the shrine of the devil's firstborn son take heed to yourself ye protestants lest ye be partakers of her plagues touch her not lest ye be defiled give a drachma to her or a grain of incense to her censers you shall be partakers of her adulteries and partakers of her plagues every time you pass the house of popery let a curse light upon her head thus said the lord come out of her my people that ye be not partakers of her sins and that you not receive of her plague for her sins have reached unto heaven and god hath remembered her iniquities these are the battles with sin and the battles with false doctrines and the battles with war fight these battles christian and you will have enough to do we must have no truce no treaty with rome war 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 with her there cannot be peace she cannot have peace with us we cannot have peace with her she hates the true church and we can only say that the hatred is reciprocated we would not lay a hand on her priests we would not touch a hair of their heads let them be free but we will attempt to destroy their doctrine from the face of the earth because it is the doctrine of demons the wisconsin evangelical lutheran synod founded in eighteen fifty stated this about the pope and the catholic church there are two principles that mark the papacy as the antichrist one is that the pope takes to himself the right to rule the church that belongs only to christ he can make laws forbidding the marriage of priests eating or not eating meat on friday birth control divorce and remarriage even when there are no such laws in the bible the second is that he teaches that salvation is not by faith alone but by faith and works the present pope upholds and practices these principles this marks his rule as anti-christian rule in the church all popes hold the same office over the church and promote the same anti-christian belief so they are all part of the reign of the antichrist the bible does not present the antichrist as one man for a short time but as an office held by a man through successive generation is the title like king of england in romanism and the reformation henry grattan guinness said the rule of rome revived in a new form and was as real under the popes of the thirteenth century as it had been under the caesars of the first it was as oppressive cruel and bloody under innocent the third as it had been under nero and domitian the reality was the same though the forms had changed the caesars did not persecute the witnesses of jesus more severely or bitterly than the popes diocletian did not destroy the saints or oppose the gospel more than did the inquisition of papal days rome is one and the same all through both locally and morally one dreadful wild beast represents her though the symbol like the history it prefigures has two parts there was the undivided stage and there was the tenfold stage the one is rome pagan the other rome papal the one is the old empire the other the roman pontificate the one is the empire of the caesars the other is the roman papacy you shrink from it do you 
I accept it. Conscience constrains me. History compels me. The past, the awful past, rises before me. I see the great apostasy. I see the desolation of Christendom. I see the smoking ruins. I see the reign of monsters. I see those vice gogs, that Gregory the Eighth, that Innocent the Third, that Boniface the Eighth, that Alexander the Sixth, that Gregory the Eighth, that Pius the Ninth. I see their long succession. I see their abominable lives. I see them worshipped by blinded generations, bestowing hollow benedictions, bartering lying indulgences, creating a paganized Christianity. I see their liveried slaves, their shaven priests, their celibate confessors. I see the infamous confessional, the ruined women, the murdered innocents. I hear the lying absolutions, the dying groans. I hear the cries of the victims. I hear the anathemas, the curses, the thunders of the interdicts. I see the racks, the dungeons, the stakes. I see that inhuman inquisition, those fires of Smithfield, those butcheries of St. Bartholomew, that Spanish Armada, those unspeakable massacres. I see it all, and in the name of the ruin it was wrought in the church and in the world, in the name of the truth it has denied, the temple it has defiled, the God it has blasphemed, the souls it has destroyed, in the name of the millions it has deluded, the millions it has slaughtered, the millions it has damned, with holy confessors, with noble reformers, with innumerable martyrs, with the saints of ages, I denounce it as the masterpiece of Satan, as the body and soul and essence of Antichrist. The saints who have gone before us have told us who is the son of perdition and the Antichrist beast. But the enemy has pushed their witness aside. We are called to expose the enemy's deceptions, cast down their power over the people, and help set the captives free. We may pay a price for our witness, maybe even our life, but the heavenly rewards for those who wage war against the enemy are priceless. Psalms 94.16 Ask, Who will rise up for me against the evildoer? Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? That's all for today. I love y'all. Shalom.